feels really, really warm in here, but it can't just be me. Okay. So it was 1974, and I was a year old. My parents moved from Atlanta, Georgia to Somerdale, New Jersey. And Somerdale, New Jersey is a suburb of Philadelphia, so it's in the southern part of the state. And they decided uh, to buy a home in a neighborhood called Broadmoor. And there were four models you could choose from. There was the Raleigh, which was a split level, and there was the Gambrel, the Nantucket, and the New Englander. My parents chose the New Englander. And for my mom, this was her dream home. She'd never lived in a two-story home before. And it was pretty classic with four windows and a central door. And she had a small vegetable garden in the back. It was 12 by 12. And the most time that I spent in that vegetable garden was to collect cherry tomatoes to fling at my brother while he mowed our lawn. <laughs> and the house lots were all pretty standard. Um, they were, uh, our houses were close. Um, it's funny, it feels like it was further away, but I was looking on Google Maps and they're actually really, really close. Um, but from the road, the front of each house measured um, very, um, it was the same for every house from the curb to the front door. So from the street side, every fourth house was the same, everything measured the same, and their plan was to build 800 homes in this development. And it, it did eventually happen. Um, my parents were working pretty hard. They were hustling the 80s. My dad got on the train to go to Philadelphia for work. And my brother and I came home and we were alone. So we had the place to ourselves. He's five years older. And we would start off the afternoon with some Elio's pizza. It was like a rectangular shaped pizza and it fit perfectly in the toaster oven. And we didn't have a microwave for a VHS for a long time. We were late adopters. But we would get the pizza ready. We probably sometimes we'd have apple jacks, and those always went into this avocado Tupperware mixing bowl. And the milk would turn a nice pink from the apple jacks. So we sort of moved between these two uh, comfort foods, and we um, we would watch TV. So he always jockeyed for for. Doctor Who type shows, and I always wanted to watch Little House on the Prairie. And for those of you who don't know, it was a TV show. There are nine seasons. I've seen all of them many times. <laughs> and um, that family, the Ingalls family, so Michael Landon was like the guy I wanted to marry. <laughs> Caroline was my ideal mother vision. But really, we all wanted to be Laura with the braids and the long prairie skirt, just you know, she was, she was it, she was, she was perfect. So there was um, a gang of us kids that would ride our bikes around the neighborhood. And in those days, I commuted on a yellow Schwinn, banana seat, sparkly upholstery. And um, it did have a flag at one point, this sort of orange flag that came up from the back, but um, Andy Milkis broke that on the tire playground. So, um, we would cruise around the neighborhood, and there was one house in particular that we were always drawn to ride by, and it was the original farmhouse for the property. It felt to us as children like it was very, very dark. And I, looking back, I think that it was because the whole place had been field. It had been a farm, so any trees that were planted were these saplings in the front of our houses. And this house had a lot that was probably like eight or nine of our lots, and it sat much further off the road and had these big mature trees. But in my mind, I remember it as just being very dark, and the window, the curtains were drawn, and the windows were dark. Um, and we would play these games about riding slow in front of the house and like daring each other. But as I got older, and especially as an adult, I thought a lot about how it must have felt to have those 800 homes built there, and whether that was the original family who had um, was still living in the house now when we were riding our bikes by. And so then our circle expanded and we got a little bit more exploratory in the neighborhood and we found a trail that left the back of the tire playground at our elementary school. And so my brother would join us, we would pack some food and we would be like on an adventure. We'd have some bologna with white bread and some potato chips tucked in and a bag of Doritos, a two liter bottle of Dr. Pepper. And we would pack all that in a backpack with our folding um, Army Navy shovels. And we would 
head over to the tar playground, park our bikes, and we would start walking in. It was sort of dark, thick trees, and then it would open up into these brushy areas. But then there was a big sandy clearing, and we were, I don't know exactly maybe what we were doing. We were trying to make room to get our bikes down the trail, and we were digging, and we discovered these um, green glassy rocks. And we really, as kids, this was this sort of magical wild space between the chemlons of our childhood. This, this, these green rocks were coming up out of this sandy ditch and these brushy trees. I mean, we were really feeling like this was a magical thing, and we were packing them into our bags and bringing them home. And the largest was like a soccer ball, and the smallest was the softball. And in our house, we were lining our mother's vegetable garden with them. And it turns out this is a super fun site <laughs> that we were playing. <laughs> so what had happened was um, there was an Owen, Owens Corning fiberglass plant across the street from the elementary school. And it had been using this site as the dump for any waste product during the production of fiberglass. And then the, the, it had burned. And so when they cleared away all the debris, they had dumped it here. So we were, we were digging in toxic waste. <laughs> but this was my first connection with the land. <laughs> and so then I, I, I sort of jump forward a bit. I'm in high school. And I'm at a Quaker boarding school. And I'm in my senior year. And it's my Quakerism class. And um, I, I learn about Helen and Scott Nearing. And there was this epiphany moment for me when I realized that Helen and Scott Nearing, who are this sort of quintessential Vermont, Maine, homesteading, back to the land couple, that like they were, they were Charles and Caroline Ingalls, like in a contemporary form, and that this life could be possible, that you could live off the land. And, um, and so then fast forward to 2018, and I don't live at Broadmoor, I live on Broadturn Farm. I live in a, the largest suburb in southern Maine in Scarborough, which is so much irony. Um, and the house that I live in is the um, original house for the farm. It's the classic big house, little house, back house barn. And if you stand in front of the big house, it's a real New Englander. It's got the same shape as my childhood home, but I think a lot about that house that was in the middle of the neighborhood, that was the farmhouse when I'm inside, and I imagine that on our farm there could have been 217 homes if it hadn't been preserved um, with an agricultural easement. So the farm has fairy houses in the woods, it has a couple streams that traverse, it has uh, 150 open acres, the rest is wooded, and it um, it does have a few dumps on the property, which we've enjoyed exploring. And they don't have any green rocks. They have <laughs> mostly like agricultural and domestic ephemera from the 20th century. And I am married to a real life Michael Landon. <laughs> Um, he, I, 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 doing this in partnership is, is truly what's the most meaningful part for me. Um, and the house I live in is, and the farm, this is my children's, this is their childhood home. And this is what they know as their um, connection with the land. And most nights I'm producing a meal for my family that's predominantly food that we've grown. Depends on the time of the year. We had pineapple last night. <laughs> and I haven't had an Elio's pizza in a really long time, but I have to be honest with you that I eat a lot of Doritos. 